A three-year-old boy has fallen into the gorilla pit at a Chicago zoo. As rescue workers scurry to save the child, an unbelievable event unfolds. Binti Jua, an eight-year-old female gorilla, comes to the aid of this injured child. Cradling him in her arms, she carries him to safety. The boy is treated and released at a local hospital, and Binti Jua is a hero. SeaWorld has set up a killer whale breeding program, so the name of Shamu can be carried on by future generations. And we were there to witness the incredible birth of baby Shamu. Throughout this video, we'll feature many more amazing animal stories, like this man who lives with black bears. Her name is the Wolf Lady. Discover how one woman has learned to love these very dangerous animals. We'll meet a few dogs who take the term man's best friend to a whole new level. Plus, we have a remarkable roadside rescue of a baby kangaroo. You'll find all this and more as Wild About Animals presents the greatest animal stories ever told. Deep in the hills of Anchura County, California, there lies a residence like no other. And while this may be a routine day for its owner, there's nothing at all routine about her way of life. Deborah Warwick is the Wolf Lady. I grew up reading Little Red Riding Hood and Peter and the Wolf. And I was always on the side of the wolf, you know, to heck with Little Red, she could get eaten. I wanted the wolf to survive. China, come here, Mrs. They are so intelligent and so misunderstood, and, and I've made it my life's work to dispel the myth of the big bad wolf. Sometimes you just get your lip and starts tugging on it, and it's like, that hurts. <laughs> Deborah has 16 wolves living with her, many of them rescued from certain death. Her passion for wolves has led her to publish a magazine entitled Soul of the Wolf. She cautions that wolves do not make good house pets. House training is virtually impossible. If you sit down to have dinner, the wolf is going to jump right in the middle of the table and take his share, and you don't dare stop him. <laughs> they get very aggressive around their food. You can tell who's boss in this pen. Deborah has named this female Chinook. Another wolf named China discovered just how voracious Chinook's appetite can be. Yeah, I let her out one day, and she ran down to visit Chinook in the, one of the other wolf pens and laid down in submission and put her ear in the pen, and Chinook decided she wanted her ear more than China did and ripped it right off. Hi, Bart. Hi, Bart, Bart. When humans fail in their attempts to domesticate these creatures, Deborah steps in. Bart was abused by his previous owner. He used to beat him with a crowbar, and he had a wolf for all the wrong reasons. It was a macho thing for him. He just wanted to show off to everybody he had a wolf, and he didn't want to take care of it. Bart was fly-bitten. He was probably 30 pounds underweight, very, very dangerous, aggressive, because he'd been beaten. Good boy. He'll jump up on me, pin me against the fence, and try to get me to look at him, because that's a challenge to a wolf. If you look at him, that means you want to fight. So I won't look at him. I'll just kind of look over his head and whistle and scratch him on the chest. And, and he's just moving his head around, trying to get me to look at him. And if I were to look at him or push him away or make any threatening moves, he'd probably kill me. Deborah stresses that wolves have been misunderstood for centuries. But the biggest misconception people have about wolves is that they will attack humans. When raised in captivity, that all changes because they've lost their fear of people. If you see a wolf in the wild, consider yourself very lucky because they're very shy, very elusive, and they don't like people. 
Deborah's love of wild animals seems boundless. She now has two baby lynx that need constant nurturing, not to mention an arctic fox that sometimes gets too close to the wolves. Come on, no, don't get too close to the wolves. No, don't get too close to the wolves. And of course, to top it off, two mountain lions. All this excitement does wonders for her social life. I don't get many dates. <laughs> I had one guy come up a few years ago. It was hilarious. He was an anesthesiologist. And it was dark when he got here, and he didn't know I had wolves. And so he walks in the house, and at the time I had a cat. And this, he sits down on the couch, and the cat runs over and jumps up on his lap, and he's going, what do I do? And this is just a house cat. He was freaked out. I go, oh my God, what's this guy going to do when he finds out what I've got in the backyard? If he came up here in the daytime, he'd run out of here screaming. And what about Deborah's dad? How does he feel about all of this? My dad wishes I would uh, get married and have a nice apartment down in the city and drive a Mercedes and be normal, but that'll never happen. <laughs> this is my life. I, I, can't, I can't imagine being without wolves. I, I could not live without these wolves. They fulfill a need in me, and I like to think I fulfill a need in them. I take good care of them, educate people about them, and I'm doing the best I can up here. We were going out to film some bushfires, and we passed a kangaroo that had been killed by a car, and it was alongside the road. So I said, well, we really should get video to show that wildlife and roads don't mix real well. When we stopped to photograph this kangaroo, there under her leg was a three-month-old baby. It was caught under the leg. It had no hair. Its eyes weren't open, but it was still alive, which really surprised us. We felt that we had to try and rescue this baby. We never thought it would survive because it was so young. But one of the people with me is a bird keeper at our wild animal park, and she has a lot of experience with young animals. picked it up, put it in her little camera bag to keep it warm, and we raced back to our motel to try and find a local wildlife caretaker who would be willing to try and save this baby kangaroo and hand rear it. We have it in this little pouch right here. It's really little and hairless. Well, it's a wee as small as that. It's pretty wee. Uh, what a hope saving it. Joan, this is Georgian Irvine from San Diego Zoo. I'm, I'm in town. Um, we've been shooting a video on koalas. We have um, a baby kangaroo. We were driving to do so. So we took it to the home of a lady by the name of Joan Puffett, who specializes in very difficult animals to raise because this kangaroo was so young, she was the specialist who was going to try and raise it. Everything is full of sand. When we first got her, she was uh, a bit bruised and battered. And we had noticed that one of her, uh, her left toe, that big toe of, on the foot, was bent. It was skewed, and it had obviously been broken. The following morning, we called, and she said, Joan said that the animal had made it through the night. She invited us over to see this little female kangaroo, and she actually let me feed her. She also let us name it. We named, it's a girl, but we named it Diego, as in San Diego. And it was just so amazing to see that this baby had actually survived through the night. So we were really hoping that, that she would live and that if anyone could, could keep her alive, it was Joan Puffett. I went back to Australia to visit Diego about four months later, and the Puffets invited me to stay at their home. We built up this wonderful friendship over the phone and through the mail. And to see Diego with fur on her, just, it made me cry. I was so happy to see this little animal. Her eyes were open. She was bright-eyed. And I just, I felt that we had done the right thing. I felt very happy about that. When I got back to San Diego after visiting Diego, I was really excited. I continued to talk to Joan Puffett, and we continued to exchange letters. I 
I came out one afternoon and she was just lying on the grass here and couldn't get up. And as soon as I lifted her, I knew that the femur was broken just by the angle of the leg. And it was really terribly traumatic because I knew that she had to be euthanized. Despite the loss of little Diego, all was not in vain. The effort on behalf of Diego taught Joan Puffett much about caring and nurturing a baby kangaroo. And that is Diego's greatest legacy. Lorenzo Abundis is a firefighter. Being a humble man, one might consider his vanity license plate to be somewhat out of character. It reads 911 Hero. But the hero referred to on that license plate is not Lorenzo. It's his dog, Cinder, a Rottweiler who saved Lorenzo's life. Cinder, look, look, let's brush your teeth. Ready, ready, ready. That's a good girl. Stay, stay. The guys at the fire station always make fun of me because they know what I'm going to do on my days off. What are you going to do on your days off, Lorenzo? I'm going to go see my doggies. I'm going to go hiking. But you know what? They're my best friends. This Rottweiler's name is Reno, and this is Cinder. Lorenzo's two canine companions who helped save his life. Bark! It began like any other day for these three amigos, heading off to the mountains for their daily hike. Cinder, around. Let's go. Bye-bye. Come on. However, that day was going to be different. Cinder, who's usually the leader of the pack, lagged behind and refused to hike up the hill. Thinking Cinder might be sick, Lorenzo decided to turn around, call off the hike, and head for home. Cinder, come here. What's the matter? Come here. What's wrong with you? Cinder was just fine. But if they had stayed up in those mountains, there's no way her owner would have survived what was about to happen. The dogs have a sense that uh, we still can't comprehend. We still don't understand how they do things, just like seizure dogs. Seizure dogs can predict seizures. And I feel Cinder has an ability to predict uh, or know what's going on with me. And she, she knows my body chemistry more than I do. On this particular day, Cinder knew something was wrong. Lorenzo Abundis was having a heart attack. I feel this pressure like something just grabbed my lungs with both hands and just squeezed everything all at once out. And the next thing I know is Reno's looking me in my face. And Cinder had the telephone right by my hand. And I was able to dial 911 with my thumb. And uh, I, I told the dispatcher that I was a fireman. I'm a fireman. And I told him I felt like I was having a heart attack. It felt like a heart attack, you know, send somebody right away. Within minutes, paramedics arrived on the scene and began administering aid to their colleague. Lorenzo was going to survive this serious scare thanks to the heroic acts of his two doggies. Lorenzo was asking me the whole way to the hospital, you know, uh, how are the dogs? Are the dogs get taken care of? Okay. Uh, and then he kind of told me that this, he started to tell me the story a little bit about what had happened. Uh, I've heard of certain, you know, stories along these lines, but I'd never really been this close to one like that. And after g having more interaction with the dogs, I absolutely believe it. Ready! Ready! Today, Lorenzo has fully recovered from his heart attack and strongly believes Cinder's sense saved his life. If that would have happened to me up there in the high altitude, for sure I would have been dead up there because I would never have received the proper medications the paramedics had administered to me. Uh, I, would have, I, would have, I would have definitely died up there if Cinder hadn't brought me back home. As you can see, Lorenzo Abundi's vanity license plate isn't so vain after all. It's a salute to his two beloved pets, Reno and Cinder, the dogs who saved his life. This is Karen, a four-year-old Sumatran orangutan. She is one of the most popular primates at the San Diego Zoo. As you can see, she likes to put on a show. Besides being a bit of a ham, Karen is also a medical wonder. According to the San Diego Zoo, she is the first zoo animal ever to undergo open heart surgery. It 
all started three years ago. When she was one year old, the veterinarians did a physical on her and by listening to her heart, determined that there was some irregular sounds and through later tests, they determined that we're, there was a congenital defect. There was a hole between the two atrium in her heart. What then followed was simply remarkable. A top-notch medical team was assembled to perform open-heart surgery on Karen. After months of planning, the day finally came for her surgery. If we had not been able to do the surgery or had not chosen to do the surgery, it would have been, uh, she would have had major problems as she got older, probably growth problems as well as uh, heart and lung problems in the future. Because humans and primates have a lot of anatomic similarities, the operation was approached just as if they were dealing with a small child. Performing the operation was the world-famous cardiac surgeon, Dr. Stuart Jameson, who wore a special camera to document this historic procedure. In order to close the hole between the two upper chambers of Karen's heart, a patch was taken from the tissue surrounding her heart. This patch was then sewn onto the troubled area of the heart. The entire procedure lasted four hours. After the surgery, Karen slowly regained consciousness. The days following any surgery like this are delicate, and for Karen, her health did not improve at first. She had trouble breathing and then fluid was discovered in her lungs. Yeah, it has been touch and go for, for the whole time. and It's been a big roller coaster for us. She's made uh, little improvements that we've probably gotten more excited over than we should have, and then she's gotten, uh, gotten worse, and we've probably gotten more down about those than we should have. But, um, but there were times, yeah, that that with my experience working with animals in the situations that we are, I didn't think she had much of a chance at all. After three weeks of intensive care, Karen's condition finally improved. You didn't have to be an optimist to see that she was now on the road to recovery. Over 100 people had volunteered their time for Karen, including surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses. Now, at last, they could breathe a sigh of relief. This is like one of the greatest thrills. Uh, you know, we took a patient who was critically ill, pretty much on the, you know, on the verge of not making it, and succeeded you know, weaning her off a respirator. And uh, it's just you know, one of the greatest feelings. Today, Karen is fully recovered and up to her old tricks. Some people wondered, after Karen's long recovery, if all the trouble and expense had been worth it. Perhaps the best answer can be found in the irony of it all. When man first learned how to conduct open-heart surgery, he experimented with primates. Once mastered, this procedure has saved thousands of human lives. And now, for the first time, this operation has been used to save the life of a primate. At the very least, this is man's way of finally saying thank you. I grew up reading outdoor magazines and seeing bears portrayed as dangerous. I read the brochures that just portrayed bears as dangerous and unpredictable, and that didn't distinguish between grizzly bears and black bears. So the image I had of a bear is an animal that would attack on sight. A bear. And when I found that they didn't do that, in fact, that they were timid, they are peaceable. In fact, I came to think of them a lot like uh, the gorilla story. That we used to think of gorillas as savage uh, boogeymen of the jungle. And then Diane Fossey and others showed us that you can actually live with these animals. They're peaceable and timid. We're finding the same thing out about black bears. For nearly 30 years, Dr. Lynn Rogers has been working with black bears in northern Minnesota. In this footage, taken by Lynn in 1986, he documented the habits of a mother bear and her two cubs. The biggest obstacle Lynn had to overcome was learning not to overreact to the mother's bluff charge. 
Lynn discovered that when black bears get nervous, they will feign an attack, but never follow through. Pretty soon, he was able to gain the trust of the mother bear and follow her every move. During this experience, Lynn dispelled many myths about the black bear. One of the main misconceptions is that uh, you never get between a mother and her cubs. And this would be true for grizzly bears. 70% of the gri uh, grizzly bear killings are by mothers with cubs. But with black bears, uh, that's not the case. Black bears seldom defend their cubs against people. In 1969, Dr. Rogers was one of the first to use radio collars on bears, which enabled him to track the movement of black bear families for generations. Uh, we learned that mothers, uh, the females, maintain territories two to four square miles usually, and that the males have large ranges that are indefensibly large. We had one bear that went 126 miles out in a poor food year and then came on a beeline back home. From the end of September to the beginning of spring, black bears hibernate in a variety of shelters. Even when they were sleeping, Dr. Rogers was there. What we would find is bears whose heart rates are down between 8 and 22 beats per minute, as opposed to a summer norm of around 100. And their metabolic rate is cut about in half. They're only breathing once every 45 seconds or so instead of uh, 10 to 20 times a minute. From their social hierarchy to their eating habits, Lynn Rogers rewrote the book on these peace-loving animals. He also illustrated the book with his second profession, photography. I, I admire bears for being so big and strong, yet timid and peaceable, and, they're, and I admire their intelligence. Black bears are probably the most uh, intelligent mammal on the North American continent, except, except for people. Dr. Rogers' detailed research has made it easier for other wildlife professionals to better manage the habitat for these bears. But these extraordinary animals are not out of the woods yet, so to speak. One of the problems for bears today is that baby boomers are reaching the age where we have discretionary income and where we can live by faxes and modems and not have to be tied to the economic centers. So we're moving into bear country in unprecedented numbers. And our attitude towards bears is going to make or break the future for bears. If we will tolerate bears and be willing to coexist with them and just look at them as interesting creatures, then there's plenty of room in the woods for bears and people. But if we're going to continue to think of them as uh, dangerous animals that must be killed to protect every last bit of our safety, uh, then we'll wipe out bears wherever people become dense. Her tale is one of tragedy and hope. The impact she has had on those who have known her is immeasurable. Yet we would never have met Inky, the pygmy sperm whale, had it not been for man's contamination of the sea. Inky's story began in the fall of 1993 when she was found stranded along the New Jersey coastline. Clearly in distress, the whale was transported to the National Aquarium in Baltimore, where she was examined by Dr. Brent Whitaker, the aquarium's director of animal health. The Inky was in very poor condition. She was very thin, she was dehydrated, uh, and she, she looked like an animal that was close to death. Uh, we thought any minute she would go into shock and simply fade away from us. Luckily, the aquarium staff was able to stabilize Inky, but there was no doubt the whale was still suffering. 
we were able to take a radiograph because we suspected that she had a large amount of gas within her belly and we didn't know where it was and why it was there. Then in monitoring her behavior in the pool over the first few days, it was clear that she couldn't swim to the bottom of the pool. She would simply bob back up to the surface like a cork. After weeks of testing and evaluation, the cause of Inky's poor health finally came to light. We ran several tests. One was ultrasound, and on ultrasound we saw that there was a cystic type structure, but we, we couldn't tell what it was. It wasn't something that we'd been used to seeing. The next step then was endoscopy, and it became very clear with the, with the endoscope, which has a small camera mounted on, on the end of it, we could go right down through her esophagus and into her stomach and look. And we found everything from uh, green plastic to black plastic to mylar, pieces of a mylar balloon, that sort of foil type balloon that you get and says happy birthday on it. It took six procedures and a total of nearly four hours to remove all of the plastic from Inky's stomach. Once her digestive system was cleared, the whale's health improved dramatically. Her appetite increased greatly. She began to put on weight, which was a, a, a pleasure to see. She began to be able to dive. There was no longer this problem with the gas in the stomach. And she, she just looked like a different animal. It was tremendous to see. When Inky was given a clean bill of health, it was time for her to be released back into the wild. Her time in captivity was over, but her importance in teaching man to care for his environment is long-lasting. We love to believe that because they are wild that they are safe, and, and that's not true. And in many cases, it's because we put garbage into the environment, or we alter their environment with pollutants or some other, other um, activity. She was quite a beautiful uh, animal, and she had so much to teach us, if only we would ask the questions and, and learn. We hope you've enjoyed watching this video and look forward to bringing you more of the greatest animal stories ever told. For everyone here at Wild About Animals, we'll see you soon.